He didn't say, I give you power over all the power. He said, I give you authority over all the power. And if we think that we can use a gift to remove a demon, we will come to a quick standstill. When we think we can use a gift to remove an illness, we'll come to a quick standstill. But if we understand it is authority that removes illness, and it is power that recreates a, an organ, a thumb, an eye, an ear, then we understand that, that this, author, this power is great. We, we need it, but we need authority more. And it only comes by relationship. You'll hear me say this maybe a hundred times. Because today, there's a, there's a growing belief that grace means you don't need to seek God. And it's growing. Grace means I don't have to repent. And we're all, it's almost like all we're concerned with is getting through the pearly gates and not with the level of quality of life we live on earth with the Most High. And we can live a life with Him far superior to the life we're living right now. We only understand how it works, the system. The centurion came to Jesus. He said, go and heal my servant in Capernaum. He said, go and heal my servant, or would you heal my servant? And Jesus said, yes, I will go and heal your servant. And the centurion says, wait, 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 wait. You don't have to go. You don't have to go and heal my servant, for I am a man under power. Oh, you read the Bible. Very good. I am a man under authority. He wasn't talking about power. He says, authority. Authority will heal my servant. I say to, my, to this soldier, go and get that. And he goes, go and bring it. Say to another, go and bring me that. And he does. I say to my servant, do this. And he does. I understand this, how all this works. You say the word with your authority. Whew, it happens. Authority. We keep thinking power. Give me power. And I want power. I, I want power. I want to see deformities made straight. I want to see eyes made, made whole. I want to see limbs grow out. I want to see this. Don't get me wrong. But we, we dismiss as irrelevant authority. And it is more relevant than power. We need both. Man lost authority in the garden through his disobedience. How did that happen? God gave Adam authority over the earth. Subdue the earth, take dominion over the earth, be fruitful, multiply authority. Satan, who lost authority in the fall, Notice, no other spiritual being was closer to God than Satan. We don't know what his name was. Satan is a title given to him. It is not a name. It's a title. There may be a king, but that's not the king's name. Richard might be the name. Henry might be the name. Title is king. Satan is a title. Man called him serpent. Man had authority over everything, and man named everything. Man gave everything its name because God gave authority to man to name. And that what you name, you have authority over until they marry and form a whole new authority structure. They leave the mother and father. That means they leave the authority of the mother and father and then now cling to one another and have a whole new authority structure. Satan, in losing proximity to God, lost authority. Retained power because it's a gift. Gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. Gifts are irrevocable. Satan's power is irrevocable. But the authority is proximity-oriented, relationship-oriented. So what happens? Satan sees man has authority given to him by God. Satan has no authority on the earth. In fact, Satan has to obey man because man named him serpent. 
So now, serpent has to obey man who named him, and so now serpent comes in, and he, he comes in and tempts man. When you read that passage, you find out something very interesting. You find out that Satan used Scripture until Eve added to Scripture, and when Eve added to Scripture, Satan then twisted Scripture. It's Eve gave Satan permission to twist the Scripture by adding to it when she said, neither shall you touch it. But God didn't say, neither shall you touch it. He said, you shall not eat of it didn't say, neither shall you touch it. And so when she said that, she gave permission to Satan to twist the scripture, and he did. Now, fast forward 4,000 years from Adam and Eve to Jesus, because that's how long it was, 4,000 years. Satan had authority over the earth for 4,000 years. Satan then comes to Jesus after his fast, takes him on a pinnacle, shows him all the kingdoms of the earth in one moment of time, and says, see all these these I will give to you and their authority, for it has been delivered to me. Who delivered the authority to him? Adam and Eve did, exactly. Notice he did not say dunamis. For all this dunamis, all this power, their power has been given to me. He said that the authority has been given to me. Satan knows authority trumps power. He wants that authority. And every time he tempts you, it's to get authority from you. Because every time you obey him, Paul says, the one you, who, to whom you obey, you become its slave. In other words, it takes authority over you. Every time you sin, you've just given Satan more authority in your life and removed God's authority from your life. Every sin. I'm not saying you're removed from heaven. I am saying you lose authority. And that's why Jesus said, uh, you're not going to see me for a little while because the evil one is coming and he has no part in me. No part in me. What does that mean? I have not submitted to him in any way. I have nothing in common with him whatsoever, and I'm going to keep it that way. Here's what we find in church. Many churches teach this today. They teach you how to walk on the edge of heaven. If I stay right here, I won't fall off and I'll be okay. And, if I, and so I can get away with this and still make it in just as long as I don't cross that line. Well, here's what you're teaching the people. You're teaching them that on this side, I can rub shoulders with darkness. And on this side, I can rub shoulders with the kingdom. And I'm going to be okay. That's called lukewarm. And when that happens, to the degree you touch darkness, you have something in common with Satan, and he has a part of you. When Jesus descended into Sheol to preach, to preach the good news, after he was crucified, he was able to stand before Satan, and Satan inspected him and found no sin in him, no compromise in him, no darkness in him. Not one shred of submission had Jesus in him to Satan. And therefore, here's what Jesus was able to say. I am sinless. Satan, you are not sinless. You rebelled. Therefore, I, by sinless, have authority over that which is rebellious and sin. Give me the keys. He didn't have to yell. Authority does not have to use volume. Authority is that presence which says, you be removed. Now, I'm not saying yelling is wrong, but yelling should be because you're impassioned, not thought of as the louder I get, Satan will obey. Loudness has nothing to do with authority. The judge doesn't yell, you're guilty! 500 years in jail! Why? Because he has authority. You're guilty? This is the sentence. Officers of the court, take him away. It's authority. And again, it only comes through relationship. 
anything that says we don't have to work at relationship. Now, we do not have to work at salvation. You know what? I didn't have to work at falling in love with my wife. I fell in love pretty quick. In fact, I saw my wife walking down the hall of a church. She walked past the door. How long does it take to walk past a three-foot door? One second? I'm talking to my sisters. I see my wife walk past the door, and I looked at my sister and said, excuse me, I just saw the woman I'm going to marry. And I walked out. And I walked down that hall, and I said, I don't care what room she's in. She could be in kindergarten. I'm in that class today. <laughs> I knew. I had to work at this. I knew. But you know what? We've been married right at 40 years, and, and we've had to work at that. We've had to work at this. I mean, it was, when this, that relationship has required some work, especially on my part. And if you believe that, I, I, if you believe that, don't ever talk to my wife because she'll tell you the truth. No, you have to work at relationship. Salvation may be free. It is absolutely free. Not maybe, it is free. But boy, relationships are costly. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes trying to understand. It takes why are they thinking this way. It takes trying to find why does my wife like this and not that? Why does my wife like cherry and not berry? <laughs> Strawberry, net. Cherry, yes. See, you learn, you learn this. And you learn never buy a dress for your wife. I say, honey, happy birthday. Here's some money. Go buy you a dress. Because here's what happens. <laughs> here's what happens. I buy the dress that I think is absolutely stunning. And she goes, thank you, honey, that you thought of me. I, I thought of you? Well, yes, I did. And it's, it's gorgeous. She goes, <coughs> well, uh, <coughs> Let me, I'll just try it, I'll, I'll try it on. And you know what? No matter how good it fits, there's always something wrong. Like, oh, the seam is crooked. It's a little bit too long on me. It doesn't go with my shoes. You know, something is wrong. Now, there may not be anything wrong with the dress, but it's the excuse to go get the dress she wants. That's what this is. This is the excuse to go get the dress she wants. So you learn. It takes effort to have a relationship here. She didn't have, she can go buy me shirts. I don't care. Yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, every shirt she's bought me, I've taken easily. So, so we learn. I'm easy to please. She's not. <laughs> and, and, and we are going to ensure this tape never leaves Canada. <laughs> Are we streaming? Oh. <laughs> Here's what we got to do. We gotta, let's, let's rewind. <laughs> we'll take that back. <laughs> you know, you have, to, you have to work at authority. Falling in love is easy. But boy, authority, it takes effort. How do you start working at authority? You start working at authority with, with something called obedience. God starts working with obedience in our lives, and then he takes it one step deeper. He takes it from obedience to something really, really hard called submission. You see, I can be obedient and still not like it. God says, put $100 in the offering. And I go, oh, this has got to be the devil. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. No way, this is, uh-uh. God says, put $100 in the offering. But God, if I put $100 in the offering, I don't have gas money for the week. Put the $100 in the offering. But God, if I had do that, I won't have money to eat on during the whole week. You don't want me to starve. You haven't called me on a fast. I didn't hear you say fast. <laughs> he says, put the $100 in the offering. But God, 
I know you can provide everything, but this is money. So finally I go, okay, here. Now I'm obedient. I am not submissive. What is submissive? Submissive is, God says, put $100 in the offering, and you go, Lord, you know my situation. You know the gas, you know the food, you know my situation. If you're telling me to put $100 in the offering, it must be far more important than my food and my gas. And therefore, you will provide everything I need. And if this is more important to you than my food, then I give this because it is very important. That is submission. And that is why God is called, that is called cheerful. Why? Because obedience involves the doing, but submission involves the emotions. And that's why God says, I love a cheerful giver. Never says I love an obedient giver. I love a cheerful giver. Oh, I just hit, oh, right in the solar plexus on that one, didn't I? So what did Jesus do? Authority is a result of obedience taken to submission. Man lost his authority in the garden. Jesus came to get back authority. How did he do that? By the utmost submission and obedience a man can give. And that is to the death, not just death, death on the cross. You see, when Jesus, Philippians 2, you can read this for the sake of time. We don't have time to, to, to go that way right now, but read this. Let this mind be in you, and then find out what that mind is. It's an obedient, obedient mind. Philippians 5, 5 through 8 tells us the ultimate obedience. Verses 9 through 11 tells us the result of ultimate obedience. As a result of ultimate obedience, God highly exalted him, gave him a name above every name. That's authority. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. That's authority. What do you do before a king? You bow. What do you do before, before power figures? You, you, you honor them. Those that have rule over you. See, to the obedience of the Father, Jesus humbled himself twice. He humbled himself to become man, and he humbled himself to die. He could have stopped both of them, but he chose not to. By the time Jesus came into this world, he had so emptied himself of his glory and his power and his status and any form of divinity that no one recognized him as God. Even those closest to him took a year and a half to discover that. Yeah. All the spiritual leaders of the, of the time treated him as simply a man, an ordinary person of the world. And as a son of God, he will, willingly submitted himself to the Father's authority and even declared the Father is greater than I, though before he came, they shared authority in heaven. And so he allows the Father to become the, the emblem of authority to everyone. And Christ becomes the symbol of submission to everyone. For Christ to be obedient and to come to the earth, he had to empty himself of all of his divinity, take the form of a slave before he was even qualified to obey. The prayer of Jesus in John 17 tells us that Jesus originally shared that same glory and authority with the Father. But when he came to the world, he had to leave that authority behind. And he had to accept the human limitation of time, space, and physicality. He humbled himself further and became obedient even to the pain of the death of that physical body. And because of that, the Father exalted Jesus with the highest possible authority that every knee and every tongue in heaven, every knee and every tongue, every tongue would confess, every knee would bow, heaven, earth, anywhere, ever. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered, and it perfected him. 
Why are we so pain avoidance? We're full of pain avoidance. Yeah. Ultimate authority. Hebrews 5, 7 and 9 says this. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. Now get this. This is something very important to me. It's, apparently it is to God too because he put it in the Bible. Jesus had godly fear because of his godly fear. I just can't, I can't quite fathom why people say we should, would no longer have to fear God. If Jesus feared God, how much more should we fear God? Now, I'm not talking about the tyrant who, is, who, is, who is, beats us. I'm talking about this reverential awe of divine power so great there's nothing in humanity comes even close to him. Jesus had godly fear. See, I, it is absolutely unbiblical to say we no longer need fear. Well, when it says, well, it says, come boldly into the throne, yes. But I can tell you this. When you come boldly into the throne, you don't come into the throne and go, hey, God, give me five, man. You come boldly into the throne with protocol. In 1995, won't go into the whole story, but I was taken to the throne room. And I can tell you this. I stood right in front of the throne, and God was sitting on that throne. I saw two stones moving in, inside of him. They were fiery stones, and fire was coming out of these stones. It was absolutely phenomenal. But here's one thing I'll tell you. There is unbelievable protocol in heaven. There is reverential fear and awe of everyone of God in heaven. And we seem to have lost it. Trying not to be religious, we've almost become sacrilegious. We really border on it sometimes, if not cross full, full body into sacrilegious. You see, 